Hola, hola, buenas. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here with us for the presentation of the shards. Thank you, uh, Fundación Telefónica, for having us here and also Penguin Random House for giving us the opportunity of having this chat with uh, Brett Easton Ellis. The event will uh, be as follows. We will be chatting for about 50 minutes and then we will give some time for the Q&A. You can make three, four questions and when the presentation is over, uh, you will have the author signing books at the end of the hall. So welcome everyone. Let's start. Lose all your hope when you uh, cross this threshold is the first line in one of his novels. This is one of the main uh, misunderstandings about his novel. Um, they say that it's, uh, it lacks hope and it's uh, slow, but when you uh, send this message, it's a, an existential message, and for the fans of Ellis, as I think we all are here, uh, you need to decipher this in order to reach the core of the uh, characters in, so in Imperial Bedrooms, in uh, Les and Zero, Patrick in American Psycho, Victor in Glamorama, and obviously the character Brett Easton Ellis in Luna Park and in The Shards. The readers are always trying to find the keys to understand and decipher what type of hope is that. Uh, but maybe this sentence is just a mere sentence, as songs are just songs, and the character of Brett is in The Shards is just a lost character, a contemporary writer of, uh, the, in his middle age, uh, and who has to go back and look back in order to settle the accounts with his classmates of from that summer in 1981. In this novel, the narrator claims that he had to write for many decades, but anxiety and his own demons didn't allow it. Uh, this was supposed to be a therapeutical uh, kind of writing in order to understand what happened to him, to his uh, classmates, Tom, uh, uh, Susan and Debbie, when Robert Mallory arrived that um, devilish and beautiful being that appears at the beginning of the story and that he claims changed the life of everyone. We are here uh, in the presence of the best writer and his best novel up to now to commemorate and to celebrate this piece of work. Thank you very much. Well, you're too kind. I am not. I am not. I, uh, <laughs> neither am I, so whatever, but it, that's very nice. It's a very nice opening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, quería preguntar I would like to ask you how this writing came about, the writing of this novel. I listened to the podcast, I've subscribed to your podcast, and I wanted to ask you if what you were writing uh, throughout this process about what you wrote and what you read in the podcast is the book that you had written. and already and if the fact that you could put it into a sort of a series throughout your the episodes of your podcast this allowed you to change things uh, or if you had everything tied up before you published no i had everything um pretty much uh um uh planned uh before we did the podcast i had thought of this book in 1982 i wanted to write this book in 1982 and i had put aside less than zero to write the shards for many reasons. Uh, the shards seemed at first much more important to me. Uh, it was so personal, it was so autobiographical. I wanted to write what happened to me that year when I was 17. Uh, kind of the demarcation between adolescence, childhood and adulthood. It had happened to me though, that year <clears throat> and I wanted to write about that. But uh, the plot and the story that I wanted to tell and the relationships I wanted to write about were really too complicated uh, for an 18-year-old. I really could not write that book, The Shards. I could write Less Than Zero. Less Than Zero was uh, a hangout novel, a kind of vibe that I described writing in The Shards. Um, uh, it seemed, it didn't have a narrative, it was all about mood, it was all about atmosphere. I wrote about the parties I went to, the clubs I went to, uh, the people I had sex with, the drugs I took. Uh, I could write that book, but there was something about the emotional honesty about the people that I loved, 
and that I was friends with that I was not capable of at 18. But I had planned the shards out at 18. So the story you are reading now is the story I had planned out in 1982. Uh, it just took me 40 years to write it. And when I finally began writing it, and when it opened itself up to me, uh, I, was, I was 56, 56 or 57. And I realized when I was thinking about these characters, uh, these real life people that I was looking for on social media and I couldn't find them and I couldn't find any of the places we went to uh, the nightclubs the shopping malls the restaurants the coffee shops they were all gone 1981 had vanished in a way and I was listening to all of the music at that period again during lockdown the first months of the pandemic and for some reason I wrote the first two paragraphs of this book and they were from the voice of a 56 year old man not the 17 year old who all of these decades, whenever I tried to write the book, was the narrator. He was always 17, and I always got stuck. But at 56, I realized, oh yes, he's remembering the events of that year. And that is what unlocked the door. And also, I felt at 56, I could be completely emotionally open. I could write about love. I couldn't write about love at 18. I didn't know what it meant then, but now in the autumn, whatever, of my life, yes, I could write about it, and I, and I didn't care anymore. I wanted to write honestly about Matt Kellner, Susan Reynolds, Debbie Schaefer, Ryan Vaughn, and I think in a way I finally got to the point where I wanted to explain to them how messed up I was, all, how, what a fucked up kid I really was in so many ways, like we all are to a degree at 17. But it did not change at all. And the idea that I did write this, and I did perform it on a podcast, I serialized this book from September uh, 2020 to September 2021, is because, well, there were no guests. No one was allowed in my building. <laughs> we had nothing to tape. Uh, there were all the movie theaters were closed. I couldn't do my movie reviews. So basically, I told my producer, I'm writing this book now. It's come to me. No one has ever serialized a, pod, uh, a novel before on a podcast. So let's try it. And he went, oh, I don't know. And then I did the first chapter, and people really liked it. And so for one year, every two weeks, we did a new chapter. And that does not mean that the book I was writing was conforming to the podcast. No, not at all. The book I was writing was the book I always wanted to write. We just recorded it for the podcast. And it is still up. If anybody wants to go to the Brett Easton Ellis uh, page on, the, on Patreon, mm -hmm. the unedited, unedited version of the, of the Shards is still up and will always be up. It's about 80,000, 90,000 <laughs> words longer than this big book. Um, but what worked on the podcast didn't necessarily work in the book, and so I took that stuff out. But um, if uh, anyone wants to do that, it is six euros. <laughs> I think relatively cheap. I think relatively cheap. So anyway, that's a long answer to a simple question. No, 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 it's fine. Um, precisamente ahora que hablas de, de, de... Precisely, you tell us that it's the voice of a middle-aged person that tells the story, and not a teenager, a 17-year-old. Um, it shows in the writing that there's also a sort of um, a tender approach to the feelings than in other novels that you have written, maybe even the way that you deal with sex, with love, and um, for instance, it's less mechanical, we could say, than in other other novels of yours, like in Glamorama, where you, you find one description after the other, would you say that the characters were demanding this approach? Because the feeling that you get is that there's this sort of uh, play between the narrator and the and Brett as a writer, which is very interesting. It gives us um, a character that is very honest in everything that he can be honest, in particular in what it comes to sexual desire. Um, it's me. It's me. It's not an intellectual exercise. Uh, all of the books I've written have been a reflection of where I was at a certain time. Lesson Zero is my college years of Rules of Attraction, 
when I moved to New York in American Psycho, when I was trying to grapple with uh, my ridiculous celebrity in Glamorama, um, when I was having, uh, you know, when I was working in Hollywood with Imperial Bedrooms, every book has aged with me. The narrators have aged with me. Uh, so I'm always writing about myself. Uh, and I've changed a lot. I've changed a lot. And when I was working on this book, I felt very vulnerable and I felt uh, much older. Uh, I, I, I didn't care about the stylistic choices as much as I used to. Uh, I was very happy writing Glamorama for eight years. It took me eight years to write Glamorama during my 30s. And I was very conscious of every single line of dialogue, every single sentence. That's great. That's really cool to do. And I had the best time writing Glamorama, and I'm glad I, I wrote that book. I would never approach a novel that way now. Uh, just like I would never write American Psycho now. I could never, I don't have enough time to listen to Whitney Houston and Genesis <laughs> and Huey Lewis in the news for a month, a month, and write those chapters. I just don't have the time. In my 20s, it's, it was really funny, and it was far harder to write those scenes than the violent scenes. But um, it was, uh, each book has changed with me. So by the time the shards let itself be written because the book tapped me on the shoulder and said, I think we're ready, um, I was a different person. And I had no problems writing about, really quite honestly and graphically, about my feelings, my feelings about my classmates, my love, of my classmates in a way that I'd never written before. And I've been taken to task <clears throat> in the United States for writing quite exp explicitly about under underage sex, teenage sex. Uh, the critics in the state thought this book was pornographic. I don't think it is at all. I remember being 17 and I remember the sex I had at 17 and I just described it as it was. I don't think it's pornographic. I think other writers might, at my age, might be shy or not like to go there. But again, that was just an example of something where I just didn't care anymore. I wanted to write honestly about that period and I had I felt completely free. Se nota porque, um, it shows because um, besides this that you mentioned about tender and the love and honesty and sex, um, when I, I listened to you in your podcast, you said that when you were looking at, uh, you were watching uh, Once Upon in Hollywood, um, you realized that there were certain things that were possible in the past. And this happens also in the book. There are certain uh, parts that have a part of you that go beyond fiction when uh, life, when we didn't have mobile phones, where teenagers had a life beyond the life of their parents, which is something that we see in the movies of the 80s where there are no parents to be seen actually and um, I wanted to ask you do you talk a lot about the age of the um, empire and the era of the post empire and um, would you say that the imperial time where this book is uh, located in terms of time is connected to you, um, to uh, in your eyes, to an idea of liberty that doesn't seem so possible right now? Yes, uh, this is true. Um, it was a, well, this is so cliche to say, it was just a very different time. And uh, children lived in an adult world. The world wasn't made for children. The adults didn't care about children. I was never asked, oh, honey, what do you want? Do you want to see this? There weren't 30 channels on TV that gave me animated movies 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Nothing. There was nothing like that. We were never asked what we wanted. We lived in a fully adult world, and we conformed to what the adults wanted. And in a lot of ways, that helped us grow up. I, it's very hard to explain, or maybe it's not. But I remember thinking that, okay, well, I want to move into the world of adults because I guess I don't really want to be told what to do anymore. And 
So we were all striving toward the world of, of adults and of sex and of careers and of going to college and becoming adults. That's what we wanted to do. We did not want to stay children forever. Uh, I, I'm shocked whenever I see a 43-year-old man dressed as Thor at Comic-Con walking around <laughs> pretending to be cosplaying somewhere. That was just beyond us. And we would never have thought the future would be that. We wanted to go to cocktail parties, meet people to have sex with, uh, get a career to make money. We wanted to become adults. And I think that the boomer, the boomer parents, um, who a lot of people call just inattentive, were maybe in a strange way parenting in the right way. I don't know. So, um, and I wanted to capture that to a degree in this book. Coddling? coddling, helicopter parenting, asking you at every moment if you're okay, if you're okay, while slipping you a pill, I mean, it was, did not exist. Um, the suicide rate was, was like 0.1 for people of my generation during that time. It has ballooned to 5,500%. I did not know a single person on meds when I was growing up. Not a person was prescribed meds when I was growing up in 1981. A school shooting? We never heard of a school shooting. A school shooting that never happened. So it was in many ways as dark as I painted the materialism, the shallowness, uh, yes, the empty houses without parents. It was also in many ways while I was writing this, I realized a very innocent time compared to today. And that is what I often refer to as the empire. And that we're living now in a post-empire world. The empire being America really at a place where it lasted for about 40 years after World War II as this uh, place of, I don't know, strength, and then somehow it slid, I think, after maybe 9-11 and after the internet became prominent. I don't know. It, it's, it's a long, long theory, and, it, and that's not what we're here to discuss. But anyway, um, yes, the Shards does reference this a lot. Un but unknowingly, I wasn't even thinking about it. There's a scene where Brett in this goes to see The Shining, St Stanley Kubrick's movie version of The Shining. And a scene that I am asked about all the time is that Brett gets to the theater 20 minutes before the movie starts. And he just sits there. He looks around the theater. He thinks about his friends. He doesn't have a phone. He's not looking at his phone. He's just taking in. He notices who's walking in. He's looking at other people. He's thinking about his life. Uh, he has a box of candy. He can't wait for the movie to start. He starts concentrating on the screen. He's really invested in this experience, driving to a theater, sitting in a theater, waiting for the movie to happen, and just thinking about his life. And I just wrote that because that's exactly what happened to me. I went to The Shining that same day, and The Shining, the screen of The Shining is the catalyst for everything that happens in the shards. And so I get asked about that, and I find that kind of sad. Hmm. Um, let's talk about violence. In this work, um, there are ritualistic uh, murders, and nobody seems to care except the uh, protagonist of your novel, as in other pieces of work, like in American Psycho or in Luna Park, and in several of your novels. So why do you think that there's this constant in your work regarding explicit violence? And now that we're talking about this, I would like to ask you if you find it difficult to, f to write the, those uh, segments, those fragments it's not easy to read for the reader or is it easy for you or for instance you start writing ultravox and and then you play ultravox and it's easy all easy it's all easy to do writing a book is fun it's i'm i'm happiest when i'm writing a novel i don't care what it's about it's a very it's bliss bliss is the word i use when i am writing a novel and i have a novel I hadn't had one for a very long time. Um, I was, uh, here I go, I'm name dropping again. I was talking to Quentin Tarantino about this whole notion of, and he liked the shards a lot, and I'd had him on my podcast, and I had really loved Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And he had said to me about the shards, he said, you're doing what I did with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You're writing about your childhood. You're writing about LA in a certain time, um, but it's not really about you. 
it's not really so much about you because you have the serial killer, you have the stranger coming to school. And once upon a time in Hollywood, it's not about me, it's not my childhood, but it's my memory of childhood. It's my memory of Los Angeles and the people my parents knew and, and Hollywood and, gro and seeing those kind of stunt men and like B picture actors. And, um, and we were both the same age when the Manson murders happened. We were both about five or six. And they simply haunted our childhood forever. And there were serial killers all over Southern California and Northern California in the 70s and 80s. They were ubiquitous. They were the wallpaper of the evening news. Another body was found off and off, ramp off the freeway. The hillside strangler struck again. Uh, the night stalker, whoever. <clears throat> All of these serial killers were just taken for granted, and they were terrifying. They were really scary. And so I think in some way, growing up in the 70s with a lot of violent movies, let's say that Tarantino was influenced by that violence as much as I was influenced by that violence, and finding something very powerful in it and wanting to replicate it in our work, um, but we also saw it within a context. Like, I don't think reading about violent acts is necessarily experiencing violent acts. I don't think, an a, I don't think a depiction of violence is an act of violence. Uh, Tarantino often quotes uh, Jean-Luc Godard when people asked him, why is there so much violence and <clears throat> blood in your movies? And Godard said, that's not blood, that's red. You know, it's sort of like, okay, you're watching a movie, you, you really think this is... Um, I don't know. I've been... Uh, uh, I, I'm asked this question a lot. I fumble around a lot. I don't know what it is about violence that I'm attracted to, but um, really, quite honestly, we live in a terribly violent world. And if you want to go back to Shakespeare and start complaining about the, the, the horrible body count in Shakespeare, I just think it's a natural reflection of the world we live in. And I don't find uh, it difficult to write about in, um, in, in any way. I find party scenes hard to write. Really? Party scenes are hard to write because there's so many people in them. You have to choreograph them. You really have to do an outline of where everybody's going to be and what are the most important parts of the party that you're going to concentrate on. And this has been true from less than zero all the way to the shards. My books are filled with parties. There are like huge parties in all of my books and those seem to be the most technically difficult to write. Murder sequence, I don't know. They're often, they're often kind of fun to figure out, uh, even if they might creep you out a little bit, but that's part of writing a novel. Writing sex scenes turns me on a little bit as well. Mm. I feel it all when I'm working. Mm. Genial. Um, una de las, en este libro, como... This book, as we said before, um, brings this idea of bread as a character and the first person writing. And I would like to talk about, um, and because uh, your work has been related to the idea of cancellation, uh, connected to this idea, do you think that one of the issues in contemporary fiction is the way that, is the way that we take it everything so literally? The first time that I read American Psycho, I was a teenager, and to me, uh, it, it caused an, it, a great impact to realize that this was written in the first person and that this person was not a good person, it was an evil person. But I think in, throughout your work and also in the shards, um, we talk about, or are, it's a book against literally, taking things literally. Um, I, don't, I don't really know about, um, I don't know about that about Patrick Bateman. I don't know if he is evil, I think he's sad. I think he's sad, and I think that if you read the book, you can, uh, there are enough clues as to make you question his sanity and his account. He is an unreliable narrator, uh, and therefore he makes us unreliable readers. And I think what was so interesting about the creation of Patrick Bateman and American Psycho was that I never knew. Three years. I wrote that book, and there were weeks where I thought, he's actually doing this. He's actually killing people. And then there are, were other weeks where I was writing these scenes, and I thought, this is a fantasy. This isn't happening. This can't happen. 
And then there were other times where I thought, oh my God, he would kill that person. But is he actually killing the person or not? And I do think this is unresolved in the book. And I think one of the reasons why the book still, still is being read and Random House here in Spain just published a beautiful edition of it is that question remains. And with, if I had answered that question, I don't know if we'd be talking about that book so much. I think there's something about the unreliable narrator, which I have always kind of fooled around with in my fiction, that gives a book a dramatic tension that I like. I love that moment when I get to a book, a novel, where I realize that the first person narrator has just slipped up. He, he's just, he, that's wrong. That's not what I've been led to believe. I love those moments. And I think I first noticed it in Nabokov. Uh, I think it was either in Pale Fire or uh, uh, maybe even it was Lolita, where I realized, oh, this is not, he's not giving, he's telling us an account he wants us to believe, but it's not probably what really happened. Um, and this is true to the, with this book to a degree. I think one of the saddest things about this book is that this narrator, and this is not a spoiler, don't worry, there are no spoilers here. The final, final page of this book was one of the saddest things that I ever had to write. And I'm not talking about the afterword, I'm talking what comes after the afterword. There's a page that is a disclaimer. And when, this, when I realized that the Brett character was going to end this with that disclaimer, I cried. I cried. I almost now, I was in my hotel room, because I think some people mistake this final page as um, like a fake out or something, like, oh, it was all a dream or whatever. Absolutely not. It's the narrator's inability to come to grips with something horrible he has done. And so I am, um, I don't know. I mean, I know I'm, I'm just riffing off your uh, question about first person narrators and why I like them and why I use them. But um, uh, uh, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> no, me referías. I meant in particular, um, because right now we're also living a time where we see that the, li the character of the, the literal character of the fiction um, is so present. The the first person needs to be good, needs to be benevolent. The feminine characters also have to be empowered and pure. And I want to know if um, to talk also about other writers. If there's anyone in particular that you think that are is breaking the rules of, uh, you know, for instance, I. Um, I think that there are some writers that you particularly like. Um, look, I don't want to watch a likable character. Mm. I don't want to read about a likable character. I don't want to see anybody who's relatable. I want to see someone who's interesting. I want to, wa I want to see a watchable character on the screen. I do not want to see a likable character that does good things, does good deeds, is a victim of some kind. I want to see an interesting character. And they're often very flawed, deeply flawed, and they're kind of messed up, and they fuck up, and they do things that are interesting. Uh, that is my only criteria for uh, art that I'm interested in, whether it's novels or films or it's even TV shows. I mean, in the United States right now, Succession, is the most talked about television show. Uh, not the most watched. It's not the most watched. It doesn't get the highest ratings. <clears throat> but among a certain group of people, it's the most talked about TV show. And there is literally no one on it that's likable. They're all really uh, fascinatingly uh, mixed up people. And yet that show exerts a fascination because they're so well drawn. Or so, and everything in it is so dramatic that <clears throat> we don't care. And I think that's the key. I think a lot of writers trip themselves up, a lot of filmmakers trip themselves up by trying to make people, oh, that's so sweet, or that's so cute, or I relate to that. But you know, in the end, art is not about looking into a mirror. Art is about opening a window. Art is about opening a door. 
and going through that door. It is not about staring at yourself in a mirror. And I don't think a lot of other artists now think that way. They don't think about stepping into someone else's shoes and being empathic. And I do think they don't know what metaphor is anymore. Everything is <clears throat> super, <clears throat> super literal minded. Uh, they can't see something as something else. And that is also a huge barrier for creating art and for sustaining a novel, a film, a show, or whatever. Um, so this whole, uh, but, but you asked me about writers or, or artists right now that I like who break that wall. I've, I think the filmmaker Ari Aster, who made Hereditary and uh, Midsummer, he made a new movie I haven't seen called Bo is Afraid, is a millennial filmmaker who dares to make movies about unlikable people in horrifying situations. And I'm sure I could name a number of others right now. Uh, in terms of writers, there's an American writer named Atessa Moshfeg, mm -hmm. who is very fearless about writing about completely what you would call, or what would uh, the industry would call non-relatable. But in the end, they are, and that's why they're successful. Uh, so there you go. I don't know. It's interesting because the first it's interesting because the first thing that you mentioned is are the examples of shows, TV shows or movie directors and you mentioned that one thing that doesn't happen anymore is that in the imperial times of the 80s and the 90s, novels were actually events and right now um, they're not anymore. Uh, books are no longer uh, or the publishing of an interesting uh, uh, author's book is not an event anymore so i would like to ask you if this has been replaced by the tv shows by video games or by what what has replaced what are, is the cultural moment that we find ourselves in when a novel is not an event anymore it is what it is and it is in the past and there's nothing you can really do about it uh we we've moved on from that uh, I grew up in an era where the novel was the event. I don't know the last time that a novel really was an event. I would say it's Jonathan Franzen in America. It was probably The Corrections, maybe Freedom, his follow-up in 2010. <clears throat> he was really the last of a kind of literary American novelist who also was a super bestseller. And that happened a lot when I was growing up, when I saw the novels my parents were reading. But you have to understand there were a lot less choices. We had three hours of TV a night. You had to watch the show. This was before, if you can believe it, VCR or taping the show. You had to be there to watch the show or you missed it for a year. Um, TV shows, we had theater. That's for the rich, whatever. Tickets were expensive. Um, we had movies, and movies were fantastic during that era. So movies uh, f were at the center of the culture in the 1970s and the 1980s with a masterpiece coming out almost every other week that connected with a large audience and not just an art house audience. And uh, you had music, and that was about it. Now you have everything available to you on your phone. And so it is kind of, and your investment, that's the key thing, your investment in going to a movie. When I went to see The Shining, I could not buy an advance ticket to an advance show and choose my seat. I had to, you know, drive to the theater, wait in line, whatever, get the seat that I could. And that wasn't, I invested something in that. Just like I invested going to a record store and buying a record and then taking it back to my bedroom and putting the record on and looking at the cover while listening to the record for an hour. And even if I didn't like it, I had invested in it. Just like I had gone to a bookstore and I leafed through books and I bought the book. I took this thing home that wasn't on a screen and I I read it. I read usually the whole thing because I had invested in it. When that sense of investment is gone and everything is available to you on your phone, your pad, your screen, you could flick it on, you could flick it off, you can lay in bed while you're drinking and eating a sandwich going, no, no, no. You can turn off a song on Spotify after 10 seconds. I don't know. Your connection with that work of art is truly diminished. And so I think that's something that has been missing. I mean, likable or relatable characters or whatever is one thing, but our notion of investing in art has 
diminished a lot and I think that's part of the problem. I also don't think people are being trained to read novels. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in some sort of like awful having to go to an, a reading class, but just through education, through schools, that you were not we were taught to read novels and to find enjoyment in them and to find pleasure in them and to understand how they worked. I don't know if that's being taught anymore. I think what is being taught is ideology. This book was written by this person, so it's important. It doesn't matter if it's good or not, but this was written by a handicapped Latinx, uh, Latinx black slave in 1940 in the Caribbean, and you should read this book because it's about her victimhood or whatever. Or certain uh, marginalized groups work that aren't as good as Tolstoy or Dickens or whatever should be extolled because they were victims or they're of a, of a marginalized group. Um, that's happening, and I also think that is a terrible thing to happen to aesthetics. Maybe it's a good thing for ideology, but for aesthetics, it's not. Um, I wanted also to ask you, because you talk about uh, the contemporary society where everything is available at all times and you can spend your day watching TV shows and listening to music or cutting a song short in 10 seconds. And you explain this as a very contemporary thing, but in this novel, uh, we we see there's a, a word that is repeated all the time, uh, which is numberness, um, especially when it comes to talking about Susan. And at some point you say that you wanted to be where Susan Reynolds was and you wanted to write like she did, uh, the numberness as a feeling, as a motivation, as a reason to exist, the numberness as a sort of ecstasy. Um, do you think that contemporary society is much number now than it used to be back then where the narrator tells us this? No, I, um, I, I don't think it is. I mean, I think that was very specific to a particular time and place. Very much an output of punk, new wave, minimalism. <clears throat> and it was something that I noticed and my friends noticed was happening even to the degree on the art on, on record covers. Like, we remember seeing the Talking Heads Fear of Music record cover, and it was this completely minimalist thing, all black with this green lettering. And this was just one of many, many artifacts. Um, and there was this kind of minimalism and this kind of numbness in a lot of music from the late 70s that had also, and I know this is contradictory, but it conveyed a feeling. And it was so interesting. You could see it on the cover of Fleetwood Mac, Mac Tusk's record, which was this sort of like strange terrazzo record with tiny lettering and some weird snapshot of a dog. Uh, you, could, you could feel it in the clothing and the fashions of the late 70s. It was just this thing that was humming in the air that I and perhaps a few other people noticed. And I realized that in the songs and in some of the movies and in some of the minimal fiction that was being published then, they were exerting a kind of numbness as a quality, not a negation, but a quality, a feeling. And I felt it too in that moment. I thought, well, numbness is a feeling just as much as uh, laughing is or as being, uh, uh, sexually turned on is or as being sad and that was such an interesting idea to me it's not interesting to me now at all by the way but it was very interesting to me at 18 and 19 17 to try to capture the mood of that moment in a book like less than zero uh, and there was a girl there was a girl that I do write about who did uh, how do you say, exude this feeling, and I found her kind of hypnotic. It also helped that she was beautiful, and that was also a reason why I thought, it, but I think what it really was was that she had discovered something before any of us, a kind of Buddhistic neutrality. And then I kind of aestheticized it and turned it into something else. So that's what that whole numbness is a feeling is. I would never, I mean, I write about le writing less than zero in this, uh, but again, that's something that would never interest me now. I would never, never. What would you like to write now? Because um, 
We are obviously expecting your next book, of course. And um, you've talked about the 80s in this book, in American Psycho, in uh, the Informers, in uh, the 90s in Glamorama, uh, the Contemporary Times, Luna Park, and uh, Imperial Bedrooms. So we would like to know if you're going back to Bennington or to Camden, please. Uh, no. No? No, I don't think so. No, no, no. I want to... I, 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 look, I've been trying to make a movie or a TV show for 20 years. That's what I want to do. I want to direct a film. I've directed a web series. None of you have seen it. Called The Deleted. The company went bankrupt as it was airing. I directed various commercials for Europe. I directed a Persol ad. I directed Paris Opera. I did one for Dom Perignon. Uh, I have had many movies that seem to be on the verge of being made that I can direct that fall apart. They just simply fall apart. It happens all the time. And then you just take a job. Uh, Todd Fields, who wrote and directed Tar with Kate Blanchett, uh, was a very hot director in 2006 with his movie Little Children. He was offered everything. He had movies with Leonardo DiCaprio, Christian Bale, uh, all of these stars attached. It was, I believe, 17 years, 16 years. They all fell apart before you could make tar with Kate Blanchett. So he is an extreme case. He was offered stuff, he just didn't want to direct it. But the movies he wanted to make, they all fall apart. And they fall apart all the time in Hollywood and become dead projects. That has been what my problem has been. That has been my problem. But I really want to direct a film. And I had a film set to go that I had written and that I was going to direct. And of course, the pandemic happened. And that got shut down for many years. Now it's been resurrected. But now in America, there is the writer's strike. Mm. So now we're waiting for the writer's strike to be over. I don't think this movie will ever get made. Pero but that is something that I want to do. Is it about the shards? Or is no? Is it about the shards? Shards is something that um, HBO uh, got, got uh, bought um, eight months ago. Mm. They bought it in October. And uh, yes, and I was on the verge of writing the first episode when the Writers Guild strike happened. <laughs> we'll see how long that lasts. But uh, yeah, the, well actually, that, if, the, if the movie that I want to direct is not going to happen or it falls apart or we lose our cast or whatever, uh, then, and the Writers Guild strike resolves itself, then I will be writing uh, uh, every, uh, every episode of The Shards. Y la película no, pero no es esa, ¿no? La película es... But the movie is, is a different project, right? The, the one that you're developing. A movie, the movie is an old script that I wrote that uh, when I had a production company, my partner and I, I had written a couple of horror films because horror films, you can get money to make. Mm. So I wrote a couple of horror films to start a production company off. And um, this was one of them. Our production company dissolved. And then I got a phone call from my agent saying, you remember that script you wrote called Relapse? And I said, yeah, uh, there's French financing for it, like six million bucks, and you can direct it. What's Relapse? I, uh, oh, that script? Really? Oh, okay, well, let's make the deal. That's how it works. Bueno, los fans esperamos que... As the fans are expecting you to write again about Bennington uh, while the strike lasts. We have some time for about three questions, so if the, the fastest person to raise their hand will have it. I'm waiting for the too. Speak to me. Oh, I won't need okay. Thank you, Brett. It's been great. Thank you for this novel, Brett. I, um, I've enjoyed all your novels. I've been reading you since I'm a teenager. I don't really have any questions because I listen to you every single week. And as you know, you're pretty transparent in the podcast. So I don't have any questions, but I do have, like, Lucia had a, a plea in the end. Please write more. We all expect another novel. Not, please don't wait five more years to write another novel. Write one sooner. Thirteen. Thirteen, not five. Thirteen? That was thirteen? Like, thirteen wow. years, yes. Okay. Okay. So please not thirteen years, next novel. All That's right. my, my first plea. And my second plea um, is 
I would love you to interview in the podcast uh, artists. Like, for example, you live in Los Angeles, and there are many fantastic artists that live in Los Angeles. I, and I think, for example, that it would be great if you interviewed Paul McCarthy. It would be great uh, to interview Paul McCarthy, and it would be great to interview a lot of people on this podcast. You would be surprised how difficult it is to schedule anyone on our podcast. Uh, people bow out at the last minute. We think we have great guests, then someone can't make it and has to cancel. So we really are open to anyone, and we have a long list of people that we want to get in contact with, that we are in contact with. But um, uh, there are also a lot of people, you'd be surprised, who don't want to go on a podcast. And there are people who don't want to go on my podcast. I would help you with that, <laughs> Brett. Brett, so I could help you with that. With the Precisely with the Paul McCarthy thing, I could help you. I will put you in touch with my Random House people here in Spain, and they can give you whatever information you may need. Super. All right. Thank you. What a, what a nice uh, non-question. <laughs> I didn't have to answer anything. Creo no que hay por ahí. I think we have another question from the audience. for um, being so open about your writing. I have a question. If writing a novel is a bliss, what is writing a screenplay? How do those two experiences compare? And also, what does film have that you don't give up? Well, you have to understand that I grew up in the movie Mad 70s, where films as magnificent as, uh, you know, uh, uh, The Deer Hunter, Apocalypse Now, I'm off the top of my head, all that jazz, uh, Woody Allen, uh, Spielberg, uh, Scorsese, were opening every week. So it turned us into real film geeks. The 70s were this amazing opening up, a flowering of artistic ambition in American studio movie making that just didn't exist in the 50s or the 60s and it excited us and we all wanted to become filmmakers because of Brian De Palma or Robert Altman or whoever was making these very unique European influenced films for the American studios so that influenced all of my friends a lot uh, but I was also a big reader and I was influenced a lot by books uh, so I was on the fence. I loved novels, and I and I wrote two novels before I wrote Less Than Zero. Uh, Less Than Zero is actually technically my third novel. The other two are terrible. I don't want anyone to ever see them. Um, but I also wanted to be a filmmaker. And it's just that the novel writing kind of got in the way, in a sense. Um, I'm over that now, I, but I just want to direct a film. Um, the difference between writing a novel and a script really is one of consciousness. A novel is about style, a novel is about consciousness. And I realized this when I first read Ernest Hemingway, and I was a voracious reader before Hemingway. I read my mother's paperbacks, uh, I read uh, crap, I read science fiction, I read horror, I read books based on movies, I read the novelization of The Omen like 30 times in the summer of 1976, and then suddenly for a class I had to read Hemingway. And I realized reading uh, the Nick Adams story in our time and also The Sun Also Rises, wait a minute, something else is powerful here. It's not what's happening, it's how it's being told. It's the style. The style changes everything. And that was the moment, that was the line that I crossed into realizing, oh, this is what a novel it does best. It is about consciousness and it's about style. It can be about anything. You can have the best plot in the world, the best story in the world, and if you don't have a style, then I am probably not going to be interested in it. Though that's not true, I read The Da Vinci Code. I, that was very enjoyable, and that doesn't really have a style. I, I couldn't put that book down for two days, that is true. But that's the rare, rare occasion. That rarely happens. Screenplays are, I believe, and some people will disagree with me, are really about structure. You have time constraints, and you have to figure out a structure in order, and you have to have an idea that can be done in a hundred minutes. You, a novel is digressive. A novel can be as long as you want it to be. But movies made in my country need to be a certain length, and you have to be very conscious of expense. Uh, you can't have a giant party at night and it rains 
producers are not going to pay for that. We're going to get wind and rain machines and 200 extras so you can have a scene at a party. Uh-uh, not going to happen. So you, take, you, have to take, you have to be very pragmatic about things. And you just have to find a story that you want to tell, that you can tell within that time, and know how to structure it. Those are the differences. Any other questions? Hi, Brad. Uh, one of the is Glam Rama. And right now we live obsessed with the 90s again. And I would like to know why do you think we are so right now obsessed with coming back to the 90s and the Y2K? Because the 90s were awesome. <laughs> the 90s were the best decade. I love the 90s. I'm obsessed with the 90s. When I think about my life, the 90s were the most fun I ever had. And I loved being a young man in the 1990s. Uh, the 80s, I was still trying to find myself, and I was still confused about things, and that's where American Psycho came from. And I was still kind of in uh, pain, and also you have to understand, AIDS was everywhere during that time when I moved to New York. So sex was kind of out of the picture, and then sex came back into the picture in the 90s. So, you know, any era where you have the most sex is usually the most fun, and the one you remember the most fondly. Uh, and also, just the music, to be in Manhattan in the 90s, uh, with this explosion of fantastic music, fashion, uh, f in indie film really flourished. Pulp Fiction exploded then and opened up an entire world of new filmmakers. It, um, and then also uh, writers. Uh, fiction, uh, uh, publishing was still a very glamorous job. And uh, magazines were great. There were so many really good magazines in the 90s. And thick, thick like Bibles. They were huge, like telephone books. Um, so, um, and the drugs were good. The drugs were really good. The drugs were much better in the 90s than they were at any other time. Um, so all, you add all of that in together, there, it's a no-brainer. The 90s were the best decade. Of course we should be obsessed by it. I don't know if we're seeing any really great art about the 90s, but there doesn't really need to be. You know, It doesn't need to be any great art about it. You can, we can just have our memories, <laughs> our lovely memories of, the, of 1996, 95. Oh, wonderful years. Clearly, any other question? I believe this is the last question. <laughs> I would like to say that in your novel, the character of Robert Mallory enrages and makes Brett nervous and the way that he suggests the plans that he has and all the brutality that he has and all this uh, cat and mouse play that he carries out and at the same time he feels a great erotic attraction for this character and uh, some at some point he, he says that uh, fear at times, sex is not connected to fear, and I would like you to elaborate a bit on this concept. On the con on the concept of uh, I I understand what you're saying, and, and again, without I mean uh, spoiling anything for those of you who have not read the book, um, the catalyst for the events in the book to take place are yes, a new student comes into the group that Brett is a part of, uh, a very popular group that Brett is a part of yet secretly feels very distanced from, but he needs this group. He needs this social hierarchy uh, to get through his senior year and to get out of there. Uh, the alternative is unbearable to him. So he pretends to be the girl, the boyfriend of the most popular girl. He, he, he's friends with the homecoming king and quarterback and all this stuff. It's all very carefully set up and somewhat fake. And then this figure comes in who threatens to destroy the entire thing and rearrange this thing that Brett so badly needs to be the tangible participant is what he calls himself. Without this group, 
he'll just be lost and drifting. At least this fake group grounds him. At least it gives him some sense of safety and he can hide his homosexuality and whatever. So this kid comes into the group, Robert Mallory, and Brett does become obsessed with him uh, for a couple of reasons. He's afraid he's going to screw up the group. He's going to dissolve it by breaking it up. And also Brett, I think, becomes obsessed with him sexually. Um, the line that you're quoting about fear and sex and all of that stuff is, uh, well, to a degree, it, it's believable when you're 17, I think, to uh, have those emotions uh, mixed in. If I'm answering this correctly, what do you think the question is, the, it really is? What do you think it is? I think it is about that duality between being, like, being attracted to someone that also terrifies you a bit like you know in a way pop stars are that no yeah no i know i know i know i mean i i don't know really what to say about that i mean what well i've also been attracted to people who like bore me a little bit too so it's it can go both ways i mean <laughs> i don't know so i think it's uh yeah it's it, it, it's more exciting when they terrify you, I admit that. <laughs> but uh, usually they're a bit boring. <laughs> but My <you're>... type. <laughs> Con estas declaraciones terminamos la sesión. With these last words, we are finishing today's uh, event. How are you? Thank you very much. Hey guys. I guess I will sign books. Sí. I'm going to go back there and then uh, I will see you all later at lunch. Sí, ahora